Welcome guys to another video. Today, unfortunately, is some sad news. There is a picture for George Mason University, just 20 years old, saying Ho Beck, who died. He ended up getting Tommy John surgery where he needed, he needed his ulnar ligament to be repaired. He goes through with the surgery. This is a very routine surgery, not a scary surgery at all. And afterwards, he ends up developing a blood clot in his lungs, a pulmonary embolism, and that ends up killing him. Pulmonary embolism is a very big topic. There's all sorts of levels of severity of disease. Some people have small blood clots. It doesn't even cause them to have any symptoms. They don't even know they have it and they're walking around just fine. On the other end of the extreme, sometimes people are just walking around just fine and all of a sudden they develop a huge blood clot in their lungs and they end up dying instantly. They don't even make it to the hospital. Then there's everyone in between where you have these different levels of severity. When it does cause symptoms, it can cause chest pain, shortness of breath. Usually the chest pain is a pleuritic type of chest pain, meaning when they take a deep breath in, that's when it hurts more. That's a pleuritic chest pain. There's two broad categories of pulmonary embolism. There's provoked and then there's unprovoked. So unprovoked, for example, if someone has a uh, a surgery where they're immobile, they're not moving around, they're in a bed for a while, and then they develop a blood clot. Well, that's a provoked cause. And unprovoked is where we don't have a reason to blame it, but they develop that blood clot anyway. And the reason why that distinction matters is because it's, it's gonna affect the length of treatment for most people. In terms of risk factors, there's all sorts of risk factors. Most people who have a blood clot don't have just one of these risk factors, but they include obesity, smoking, immobility, um, but also genetic factors as well. There's factor five Leiden, there's prothrombin gene mutation, there's lupus anticoagulant and other uh, disorders that are inherited that make people more prone to getting clots. I can tell you from a critical care standpoint, there's certain times where people come to the intensive care unit, they're very sick, but we can't get a diagnosis. And there's actually a study that looked at people who died in the intensive care unit from a medical illness, but it couldn't be diagnosed. And there's probably three or four of these most common types of diagnoses that ends up killing people where they discovered it at autopsy, so post-mortem, where they figured out the diagnosis when it was too late. But the point of doing the autopsy is to learn what caused the death. So the most common causes of death when they go undiagnosed in the intensive care unit are pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction, and infection, including infection with aspergillosis. So another takeaway from that point is that pulmonary embolism can actually be very tricky to diagnose. There's all sorts of tests that we can do that can clue us in to the diagnosis, but there is no single definitive test that always tells us for sure with 100% certainty whether there's blood clot or not. And actually the most accurate test uh, the gold standard, if you will, is actually doing a pulmonary angiogram or pulmonary angiography. And that's lo literally where we are injecting dye into the pulmonary arteries and then we're seeing all the arteries that are being fed to the lungs and seeing where there's a filling defect. Now that is not very practical, it's invasive, it requires a lot of contrast, which has its own risks associated with that, including risk of kidney damage and a, a risk of allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, and so forth. Um, so that's not a very practical test, even though it is the gold standard. And so just about no one, no hospital in this country diagnoses pulmonary embolism by means of angiography. So the way that it's best diagnosed besides that would be doing what's called a CT, a CAT scan of the chest, but not just a regular CAT scan, it's a CT angiogram. And in that case, it's doing a CAT scan combined with injecting dye into the vein here, and then that dye travels down the bloodstream, returning back to the heart by means of the superior vena cava. And then that superior vena cava joins the right atrium of the heart. The right atrium sends blood to the right ventricle, right ventricle ends up peeing, ends up not peeing, ends up pumping blood by means of the pulmonary artery to the lungs. And then those pulmonary arteries get smaller and smaller until they eventually form into capillaries. There, it picks up oxygen in the lungs, then comes back with the oxygenated blood and it gets delivered to the left atrium, where it then gets delivered to the left ventricle, and the left ventricle pumps that freshly oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. 
what ends up when people are getting a big blood clot in the lungs is that you end up having uh, somewhere in the heart, not always, but sometimes in the heart with a right atrium, right ventricle, the clot can get stuck there or more commonly get stuck in the pulmonary artery or the branches of the pulmonary artery. And so when we do the CAT scan of the chest, we see that the dye, where it doesn't go, there's a filling defect as we call it, and that's where the clot lies. So we can actually visualize that on the CAT scan. The way that people die from a sudden massive pulmonary embolism is that that clot ends up getting stuck in the heart or in the branches of the pulmonary artery, and less blood is returned to eventually to the left ventricle where it can't pump enough blood to the rest of the body. Then organs aren't getting enough blood, tissues not getting enough blood, the organs start to die off, and eventually the patient goes into shock and dies. In the hospital, we always give patients blood thinners to prevent clots from forming in the first place unless we have a reason why we can't give it to them. For example, if they're having bleeding or if they're at high risk of having bleeding. So we know that whenever someone's in the hospital, they're not gonna be moving around as much as they normally would. And so that's why we give these blood, thin these blood thinners as prophylaxis, such as heparin or Lovenox, which is anoxaparin or Fondaparinox. So these are all blood thinners to prevent clots from forming in the, in the first place. One of the clues to having a blood clot is it usually starts in the legs. So lots of people will present with one leg having swelling in it. Sometimes there's redness or it's painful. And that's called a deep vein thrombosis. So the clot typically starts in the legs, but not always. Sometimes it starts in the pelvic veins. And what ends up happening is these clots form there. They end, up, they end up traveling up through the inferior vena cava, the biggest vein in your body, to the right atrium, and then that's where it goes from there. There are lots of other tests that can clue us in to the diagnosis. So for example, sometimes we'll do an ultrasound of the legs and we can pick up a clot that way, although the ultrasound can't pick up the clot if it's in the pelvic veins. Other tests, uh, echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart, Lots of times when people have a blood clot in the lungs, the right ventricle starts to function abnormally where it's not pumping as strong or you see dilation or abnormal shaping of the right ventricle. Then there's other tests as well. For example, a D-dimer, it's a blood test. It's very nonspecific, but sometimes it's useful to suggest that there's a possibility of a blood clot, but there are lots of other things that can cause a blood clot, so it's not a great test. Sometimes we can't get a CT of the chest because either we don't want to give them radiation, but more commonly because we don't want to give them the contrast dye because their kidney function isn't great and we don't want to make their kidneys worse. So one sort of way around that is doing what's called a VQ scan. VQ stands for ventilation. The Q represents perfusion. So what that means is we're looking at how the lungs are ventilated compared to how they are perfused and where there's a mismatch where we don't see things line up that the way they should, that could be suggestive of a, a blood clot in the lungs. So it's definitely not as accurate, it's not as sensitive as doing a CTA of the chest, but it's something that we sometimes do to diagnose it. This was an incredibly sad story, 20 years old, otherwise healthy guy, and he ends up going for surgery, he gets a blood clot. One of the risk factors that he had was he had surgery, he's not moving around a lot, and because of that, he, end up, he ends up developing a blood clot that eventually travels to the heart and then to the lungs and impedes his blood flow. Uh, and then that's uh, ultimately what led to his death. So very sad story. I'll put a link to his GoFundMe page below and uh, that's all for this video.